Yo, we're back with another edition of the How Good Is Your Team series. Here in Lucky Number Episode 7, it's all about the Washington Justice. After some inconsistency and underperformance issues, there's a lot of questions on whether or not we should take this team seriously this year. Given their offseason, I don't think anybody's going out of their way to argue their title contenders, but on the flip side, they are making some noteworthy swaps this year with their roster that could lead to some better consistency compared to 2021. How about we get into an evaluation of of the justice to figure out why. Beginning with their offseason, Washington's management did a good job of identifying key issues that had to be addressed, the most major of which would be the back line, because let's call it how it is. It was a noteworthy weak point of last year's roster. They took a gamble on closer in Bay Bay, and it failed to pay off. This back line had to change. It was way too unreliable. There were more than a few occasions where closer would be too passive, or Bay Bay would get flex support diffed. The lack of reliability put the Justice at a severe disadvantage, so the fact that they decided to start fresh here is a good place to start. Another noteworthy position that saw changes was at Tank, and this is where things get a bit dicey. Losing Fury is generally not something you like to see. His longtime presence and consistency in the Overwatch League is kind of hard to come by, and I for one believe it would have been worth holding on to him for at least one more season. But at the end of the day, Fury had a desire to play for a team closer to home, and the Justice fulfilled that request, so not much you can do. If there's any good news for Justice fans in this situation, I suppose it's that Fury was arguably coming off his worst year as a pro, so the loss might not be as bad as it could have been. Some fans argue that Fury fell off, which I personally believe is maybe going a bit too far, but I gotta admit that he was not the same player we've grown accustomed to watching. Fury ceiling and veteran presence are tough in theory to lose, but the Justice could survive. This is especially the case now more than ever, I guess, since it's a solo tank game from here on out. I find myself kind of at the middle ground with Fury. He's such a fantastic player historically, but there's no telling if he's ever going to play at the same level ever again, so for that I'd say that this loss is disappointing and tough, but somewhat manageable. As for the couple of other player departures, the Justice dumped both Jerry and Tuba, who practically never got used anyway. Jerry got some playtime early on, but he was never a mainstay in the lineup and clearly wasn't a long-term option, and this goes double for Tuba, who never got any playtime on DPS at all this year. It's a shame seeing as there was clearly some potential with him back in 2020, but oh well, nothing here is worth crying over. And just to kind of add on to trying to make a new image, the Justice also somewhat addressed the coaching situation by getting rid of assistant coach Hokery, and obviously this is only a slight change to a spot that drew a lot of criticism last year, but it's a start. A lot of people do think that the Justice coaching staff did a poor job, and I definitely agree. While it's obviously not all their fault, they deserve part of the blame, especially because they were supposed to be a lot better than what they showed. And if that's the case, I think that one assistant coach leaving may not be enough. It's better than no changes at all, of course, but it's nothing to write home about. Washington are primarily going with the same coaches, which at this point may not be the answer. I, along with many of you, have kind of lost trust in them. I feel betrayed in a way. They were supposed to be better. Now all Justice fans can do is hope that one assistant change-up is going to be enough to significantly influence how the rest of the staff performs. That just about sums up my thoughts on the coaching situation, as well as all the departures in general. So now we can move on to how the Justice decided to fill up that new space. And they started by signing DPS player Happy. It's understandable to try and take a gamble on somebody this talented, but I can't help but wonder if he was the right choice based on how his career has gone so far. Happy is one of the most dangerous snipers in league history, that much is obvious. The problem is that he's kind of inconsistent, and when you think about how up and down the Justice were in 2021, hot and cold performers are the last thing they're looking for. So in that aspect, I think this is a bit concerning. But at the same time, it's definitely not all bad. Positives do come with this deal as well. Like I said a few moments ago, Happy is one of the scariest players in the game when he's on a sniper character. If he's having a good day, he could be the difference maker you're looking for against those high-level opponents. He's proven it multiple times in the past. If the meta calls for Tracer plus a hit scan or a double sniper, Happy's a good choice, and just based on the fact that he's a better player than Jerry, at least mechanically, it's an upgrade no matter what. 
and since he's a rotational piece rather than a full-time starter, Happy might be in for his most efficient season of all time, which would be a huge plus. That inconsistency definitely does worry me, though. Picking up Happy is kind of just a big coin flip at this point. So in theory, he could either be the exact risk that the Justice need to take, or a burden that ends up slowing them down in critical scenarios. Aside from Happy, we also have a brand new support line to talk about. Washington went with Vigilante, Krillin, and Opener. And if I'm being honest with you, it's not a trio that I'm writing home about. Vigilante, I think, is definitely an exciting pickup. He was one of the better flex supports in Korean contenders. I think that if he's under the right system and he has the proper coaching and development, Vigilante could be a fantastic player at the Overwatch League level. The Justice definitely grabbed some good talent at a very important position, and they raised their ceiling compared to having Bebe. The only problem that comes with signing Vigilante, though, is he's gonna miss the first two months of play. He'll be underage until the start of July. That means the Justice will have to make do without him for the first nine games of the year. To get them by until then, they're going with Krillin, and it goes without saying that he's a less appealing option on paper. He played somewhat well on T1, and he already does have Overwatch League experience as he played on London both in 2019 and 2020, but he's just not a guy that makes you super excited. I want to believe that Krillin can have a redemption arc of sorts and maybe be reliable, but the West does have a ridiculous number of insane flex supports. I am deeply concerned over how productive he could end up being, and until Vigilante turns 18, I expect the Justice to face quite the challenge with this position on a somewhat regular basis. And if I'm being honest with you, I don't feel all that much better about main support. It's not to say that opener can't be good, it's just impossible to tell right now what he could go on to become. His relevant experiences are limited to one season of Korean contenders, a season of Korean trials, and one season of Australian contenders. The rest of his time was spent on one of Genji's sister teams. To say he doesn't stand out would be an understatement. He's not the 100% guaranteed upgrade you're looking for by any means as a Justice fan, which definitely sucks. At the same time though, and please keep this in mind, Opener is the exact kind of prospect where looks could end up being very deceiving. What I've found over the years is that these types of prospects are usually the ones that end up really surprising you. Fitz and Sanguinar had practically zero experience playing in contenders before joining the league, and they both went on to have fantastic rookie years. Historically speaking, these types of players sometimes end up being these hidden gems who make a huge difference in the long run. With all the doubts in the world in mind, I still believe there is reason to maybe feel hopeful for this guy. He's far from a guaranteed star player, but I do advise everybody to at least let him play and give him a chance. This likely doesn't make you feel a lot better as a Justice fan, seeing as the support line is kind of just one big question mark right now, but it's something to keep in mind at least. Now to wrap up your roster additions as of right now, they did sign Kalios to fill up that tank need left behind by Fury. Potential-wise, I'd say that Kalios over Fury kind of feels like a downgrade, but I honestly do not believe it is as bad as some people are making it out to be, since Kalios did play really well in contenders recently, as well as for the NYXL during the 2021 season. People are quick to forget they had a couple of nice performances on the team since the NYXL weren't very relevant. Kalios has developed quite a bit over the years since we initially saw him back in the 2018 season on the Boston Uprising. He's shown off good play on every off-tank hero in the game, and if Fury did as bad as people think he did last year, then there's a chance that Kalios can match him or maybe even be a slight upgrade. Kalios is a perfectly fine replacement who gives you the versatility and consistency you might be looking for. I'm not expecting him to be a superstar, nor do I necessarily prefer him over Fury, but that doesn't mean that he can't make a difference. I like Kalios, and I'm excited to watch him play. Aside from that, though, the only other signing that happened came through former LA Gladiators coach Ty Dola, who got signed on as an assistant. He's done a lot of great things for the Guangzhou Charge and LA Gladiators over the years. He's known for individual player improvement, as well as more of an aggressive style, which are two things that Washington desperately needed. A lot of Washington's problems last year stemmed from being too passive, as well as player inconsistency. All in all, he offers a lot of benefits both for the players and for the other coaches. One can only hope, though, that he's enough to make a difference. With the main coaches from last year still being there, it could be difficult to implement his philosophies, but at least he gives them a better chance to at least show some improvement compared to last year. 
There's your offseason recap for the Justice. A lot of the moves that they made feel risky or have certain conditions surrounding them, which probably does not feel the best as a Justice fan since you were expecting so much last year and now you're kind of hoping for a rebound year to kind of alleviate the disappointing feelings you were recently feeling, but at the very least, they at least tried. They got some talented pieces while trying to address the pretty obvious issues. In particular, they really tried hard with support. Starting from scratch is a great thing to do. The only problem is it doesn't feel like anything special currently. Unless opener is better than I think, this team's backline feels no better than average most likely. From a simple comparison standpoint, there's likely only a select handful of matchups where you'd favor the Washington support line. Regardless of the changes, they really don't feel that much better on the surface. Higher upside for sure, but it's not looking great. The good news, though, is that the rest of the team looks okay for the most part. The front line is very capable of holding their own. Mag, he was already really good last year, and he was just a rookie back then. Nobody would be surprised in the slightest if he was better in year two, and in fact, I'm willing to guarantee that most of us are kind of expecting him to take another step in his game. His hero pool wasn't perfect last year, but he just feels like one of those individuals who is going to figure things out. Maybe I'm a fool for believing in him so much, but I truly do believe that he has only scraped the surface of his true capabilities. And the same is going to apply for Kalios. We've only seen a small sample of what he can do at this level since returning, and we've yet to see him in a fully enabled environment, so I'm kind of feeling excited about him and just the tank line in general. If I'm a Justice fan, I have confidence in this part of the team. They're as talented as they come, and if they can handle what comes with Overwatch 2, and their flexibility stays where it is, or at least improves, they should be the most stable part of the roster. Then you have the aspect of the roster with arguably the highest potential at DPS. For starters, Decay's great. You know exactly what you're getting out of him. He's the superstar level playmaker that you need to have a successful campaign. The only question now is, will his backup end up being good enough? Happy is skillful. He's going to have his uses. It's just that inconsistency factor again that I'm worried about, especially because they already had enough of that last year with Assassin in 2021. Speaking of Assassin, he's somebody to be on the lookout for. His rookie year showed promise, no doubt about it, but with a lot of mistakes. I liked what he showed us at times, both on Echo and Sombra, but again, alternatively, there were times where he just would not look right and he'd make super big mistakes or he'd get totally outclassed. If he can end up benefiting from Tidola's teachings, maybe he could help this team finish a notch or two higher in the standings. Assassin, in my opinion, definitely deserves another chance due to his upbringing and immense ceiling. Sometimes it takes people a year to grow and figure some stuff out. Do I recommend putting your full trust in him right now, though? No, definitely not. He has to earn it, and until proven otherwise, I'm convinced that the only consistent performer on the DPS rotation is likely to be Decay. And obviously, that's not what you want to hear if you're a Washington fan. It feels weird, and I'd hate to be the bearer of bad news, but right now that's kind of how it feels. Overall though, I think a good bit of this roster is pretty likable. Decay, the tanks, Vigilante, they're all great, but everybody else is kind of a question mark which doesn't bode well for the Justice here in the preseason. They possess some of the highest potential of all teams, but with a lack of assurance. And what really sucks is the players are far from the only place that has something to prove. The coaching, like I've been talking about multiple times throughout this video, was a letdown last year. They have to change their philosophy, and I pray that Tidola can help them change their ways, otherwise we could be looking at a very similar campaign compared to last year. That's about it though. I apologize for sounding negative in a lot of this video, it's just that the Justice own a great deal of talent, and I'm concerned that the potential they possess is never going to come to the forefront. The same philosophies are arguably in place since their coaching is virtually the same, with a very similar feeling roster. The only difference is that they have a more skilled DPS line with more playmaking potential, plus a more promising back line, so at best, they're kind of looking like a slightly better version of last year's roster. With season outlooks in mind, how about we get into my season projections for the Justice? I'm predicting this squad to finish anywhere from 13th through 6th place in the overall standings, then 7th through 4th in the West. 
The Justice, I think, could be really, really good. A better coaching performance with a stronger support line and maybe a bit more consistency at DPS is all it takes for them to go from good to excellent. I really might be undermining how good this team can be. A great season is quite doable, but in my honest opinion, they lack the promise compared to multiple teams both from the East and West. Just like Atlanta and Toronto, they fall a little short of what you consider to be elite tier until they show further development. I do not consider them to be a top 5 team in the league or even top 3 in their own conference. I refuse to make the same mistake and assumption I did last year based on the high-end talent they possess. It's a team game, and I'm not convinced that they have everything needed to be a serious contender. They're certainly capable of being a playoff roster, but I'm not sure how much further they could take it in their current state. To sum everything up, I like the Justice, but I definitely don't love them, and I'm kind of scared to trust them after last year, I'm not gonna lie to you. They could do some great things for sure, I want to believe that this year is gonna be different, but right now I just can't get myself to do it. My trust has been lost, and until further notice, it's going to stay that way. But maybe you have a different opinion. Perhaps there's a reason I'm missing as to why the Justice could be better this year, and if that's the case, let me know down in the comments below. And if you enjoyed today's content and you want this series to continue, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe. It would mean so much to me. And until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.